This is a production of Cornell University. For those of you who haven't been to Greenwood, Greenwood is, was founded in 1838. It's an active cemetery, a national historic landmark, and an arboretum. And the national historic landmark designation is one that you see when you approach our main gates. And if you can read that description there, it says established in 1838, this was the largest and most varied of the early American rural cemeteries, carefully cited with dramatic views of the city and harbor beyond. They're paying specific attention to the importance of this landscape, of the vistas that it provided and where it was located. But what kind of landscape is this? Well, if we think about it, we give a lot of credit to our charismatic megaflora here, which are our trees, but we don't pay much attention to the things that people walk upon. And the largest by far, um, plant community that we have at Greenwood is a grassland community. Um, and so what is an urban grassland? Well, you guys can all read this definition here, but it encompasses a lot of uh, places that are usually overlooked as being grasslands, soccer fields, community gardens, private yards, golf courses, and parks all fall under this category. So let's put aside the urban forest concept for the time being and really look at these landscapes as urban grasslands and specifically because they require an, an immense amount of inputs to manage properly. So you'll see this on the screen here, it's 12,000 gallons of gasoline used to manage Greenwood's 400 acres of, 407 acres of turf. Now, when you see the equivalence here of how much that is, it really should put it into stark contrast about the amount of resources that are applied to managing this as a grassland. You know, we have these large trees, we devote a lot of care to diversifying our collection, ma managing the older specimen in our collection. But when it comes down to it, we could plant trees until the cows come home, but if we can't figure out a way to sustainably manage our, our grassland, it's, it's sort of a drop in the bucket for what we can do. So this leads to our talk tonight. And, and I'm looking at the letter that I wrote him um, in July 6th of 2015, 7.30 p.m. I wrote, my name is Joe Cherup and I was given you, this is to Frank Rossi. My name is Joe Cherup. I have long admired and respected your work and have learned a great deal from your podcasts, iBooks, and various research, resources on the turf site. I was wondering if you would like to visit Greenwood, get a tour of our grounds and discuss some of our turf concerns. If a visit, so I go on. And it's a very polite, gentle a letter that was summarily ignored for- started It started out polite. Yeah, it changed a little bit in tone later on, but it was, it started out earnest and polite. And the, re the reason I wrote Frank is because I had heard that he was the preeminent urban turf grass specialist and what, what I was concerned with was two things. The amount of inputs that we were using to manage this landscape from herbicide to carbon emitting machines, and also the prevalence of Bermuda grass, which is an invasive grass that we're gonna talk about a little bit later, but that was taking over the landscape. We could tell that what we were doing to manage the landscape wasn't working. So I began a um, dedicated approach of harassment to get Frank to come down here Finally, he did, and we began what has now be ended this past year, but was a three-year partnership really studying the effects of climate change in an urban grassland, and that grassland being Greenwood. So we wanted to accomplish both of these goals. We wanted to reduce greenhouse gas, emiss gas emissions, we wanted to stop using herbicide, and we wanted to increase the ecosystem services that could be provided by an urban grassland. So that's the origin story. I'm going to turn it over to Frank. You are. Frank? You are. Thank you, Joe. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time, Joe. Thank you for the introduction, Sarah. Thank you for organizing this and keeping us on task and on track. Um, I'm so pleased to be uh, with you here. Honestly, you know, Joe says the project, en project ended, but I think the formal project uh, where we had, where we learned how to study this place 
um, start has just begun. Um, and I think uh, getting your arms around a, a landscape as complex um, in such a unique space, in such a unique and historic glacial ancient landscape, if you will, uh, it's been really a pleasure to apply the little bit of plant science skills I've developed in my 30 year career uh, on this wonderful landscape with these wonderful people. So I'm here to tell you about some of the science that we've enacted to try to help Joe and the cemetery understand this, but presumably I can, I, mean, I can tell you from the get-go, it's a very narrow look at it, right? It's a look through a person who primarily studies intensively managed turf grass landscapes, golf courses, uh, parks, uh, um, athletic fields, and of course, uh, the American lawn. And honestly, we've looked at this project as a way of beginning to introduce ideas into the culture, into management, into operations that leads to maybe some transformation of the American lawn. It begins with viewing this grassland for what it can do, not just what it looks like. Because what it looks like is only one component of the services these kinds of landscapes can provide to us, these natural landscapes, these plant-based landscapes. Now, now again, it is an anthropomorphic view of this, right? It, it's a view of how does this serve us? And you know, you can take exception to that. But on the other hand, what it does is it helps us understand how the things we do connect to the broader uh, world, both natural world and, and, and uh, the, the sort of social world that we live in as well. So looking at ecosystem services from a scientific perspective, my colleague here, and our uh, Associate Dean of Extension at, at Cornell now, Jenny Gowniffin and her graduate student, Grant Thompson, applied this framework uh, to looking at urban grasslands uh, several years ago when I was working on Grant's committee uh, for his PhD here. And it was really uh, revolutionary to start to look at turf grass, managed turf grass systems uh, in this particular way from an academic perspective. Now, when you think about ecosystem services, you have to sort of learn some language, right? Well, what does that mean? Well, you know, here's what it means if you're in an urban environment in Portland and you're surveying the green space and you're saying, okay, we got green stuff everywhere in Portland. What is it? Well, it's either lawn grass, short shrub, tall shrub, woodlands, or an occasional tree here and there. And then what do these things do for us from an ecosystem's perspective. Not all of them, not all of them presumably, but a few of them. So let's look at how things help with runoff, right? Superstorm Sandy comes through and does Greenwood help with retaining some of the runoff? Well, I can tell you it does it so well, it washed out the ravine path and many other things uh, when the storm came through, obviously. But also you see lawn grass systems can help with purifying the air in a measurable way, right? This is data that they can take on how the air is cleaner around lawn grass areas. Carbon storage, you know, if you're looking at the lift of carbon storage in the urban environment, you better be looking at trees, right? You're looking primarily at the beautiful majestic trees that make up the landscape that is green, right? Obviously grasslands and trees provide some cooling and also recreation is a big service that the lawn grasses provide. Now, we're gonna talk more about these other ecosystem services later when Sarah rejoins us to provide that expertise at the end. But let me tell you, essentially, we talk about how we studied climate change, but I will tell you, honestly, what we studied was the downstream adaptations that people who manage these complex landscapes have to make to adjust their landscape management to address the way the climate is changing so dramatically in the urban landscape, either because it's more heavily disturbed, right? It gets beat up more, or because it's getting warmer more rapidly because of pavement. But no matter what, you gotta bury people, you gotta plant grass, you gotta cut grass. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, there's 407 acres of grass that's gotta be managed in a climate sensitive, intelligent, and what we believe to be a much more sustainable way of, of managing this complex landscape. And it begins with being data-driven. 
So where do you get the data from? Well, you get the data through a lens of what a grass guy like me thinks, you know, we should attack it as, right? Joe notices these issues. Sarah deals with these issues. What, how do we approach it from a research perspective to be able to get this operation on a path that allows it to adapt to the climate that's so rapidly changing? I wish I could give you more numbers about other things. Sarah's really done the only lift really, honestly, in figuring out what those measurable changes and advancements that we make are. I'm busy trying to get the operation adjusted to make those adaptations. So first off, we started studying the Bermuda grass, right? Then it was reducing mowing. Then it was developing from reducing mowing these perpetual meadow areas, right? And then we also have looked into resurfacing the soil handling. However, because we want to keep this short, I'm only going to be able to talk to you about those first three things tonight. So to, to really give a, a, good, a, a good treatise to, the, to what we're doing. All right. Another thing I'm not going to talk about to any measurable degree, because we only began literally to scratch the surface, even though we worked with the scientists to start to characterize some of these soils, uh, um, uh, Professor Shaw uh, and the folks at the Urban, uh, uh, the Urban Soil Institute uh, at Brooklyn College um, have, have done a, quite a bit with students there. <laughs> We've been sort of studying the disturbance handling of the soil. We're not going to talk a lot about this, but let me tell you, this is its own world under Greenwood. And the way we have to intentionally disturb it is something that is worthy of a lot more attention than I was able to give it in our particular study. Now, let's look at this Bermuda grass ball. You see this brown stuff here? This is what it looks like for about two and a half, three months a year uh, throughout the landscape. And essentially, as we've been able to characterize it, maybe about 25, we, we've got close to about 10% of the land we estimate out there now to be made up of this Bermuda grass plant. Um, this is a plant that has been able to be successful, not just because of the shifting climate, because once it got introduced, it, may, it, it um, immediately uh, thrived in a heavily disturbed area where, where you dig a lot of holes, you plant a lot of grass, you mow and bang into things and turn on things and the soil gets disturbed. And that kind of an environment is really conducive to this plant. Once it got there, we're beginning to understand some of the origins of that. Once it got there, the way it's managed and the changing climate has led to dramatic expansion. And you can-, can I, see, Sorry, yeah, Fred, oh, I, was gonna, I was just gonna say that it's not just this glaring aesthetic issue that these photos demonstrate. It's also the fact that this grass, when it's growing, grows over everything. All right, we're, we're gonna get to that. Okay. We're gonna get to that. So, so here you see when it gets dormant, right? The color that it takes on right in front of the chapel in an area that was recently renovated right before we started working with the cemetery. Now it also is impacted a bit by shade. Now this is where, you know, the Arboretum comes in and the conflict with, well, you plant a tree, you can't bury somebody there, right? So. There's always going to be these conflicts in these grasslands that are very interesting to have to deal with. And I'm sort of curious, Joe, as you think about this, maybe make this conversational right here. How do you have to then adapt the way you approach planting trees? Because I'm going to tell you one solution to the Bermuda grass issue is, in fact, planting trees. So what exactly is your question, though, Frank? How are you going to plant more trees when you need to keep burying people? That, that's a, a really direct way of asking it. So I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> it's a balancing act. We realize that each um, space that's devoted to a tree is a possible, it might not be able to accommodate a burial so that there's no loss in revenue, but it's a balancing act between the cemetery needing to generate revenue and us needing to plant trees at the same time. We work with our civil engineer, Sarah's, worked really hard on, on using our survey maps to find opportunities for tree planting. And what we're trying to do right now is, is use an approach um, that 
we established a few years ago, which is basically planting trees in groves. So densely planting certain areas and then planting along the streets as alleys, which are basically street, uh, tree-lined streets or roads here in Greenwood. So that grove style planting allows us to sort of capitalize on the available space, space from existing lots um, and work around the parameters. It, the picture that Frank's showing here is there's very little opportunity for us to plant here, but more opportunity elsewhere. And it has enormous impact on Bermuda grass because warm season grasses are shade intolerant. They absolutely do not tolerate, particularly under regularly mowed conditions. Now, if you don't mow them, Art Preston will tell you they, go pretty, they grow pretty good under his birch trees there. But once you start mowing them under shade, they really don't tolerate that very well. And here's just some of the data we've been able to generate Looking back at the models of lethal temperatures and chilling temperatures, um, it looks like about 1965 when we crossed a critical threshold where the lethal temperatures and the chilling temperatures were no longer consistently low enough to result in dramatic kill. And that's very interesting when you consider a few polar vortexes have come in over the last several years and have had virtually no uh, impact on the Bermuda grass population as we see it uh, in, in Greenwood right now. <coughs> now, uh, I want to get through some of this stuff just to tell you a little smitten of what we're doing. Uh, we put sensors into the landscapes. We've identified, this is a map of the Greenwood Cemetery looking at the microclimates. We've done quite a bit of climate modeling, microclimate modeling uh, at the cemetery, basically getting it instrumented for future study as well, this will allow us to know quite a bit more about microclimate effects as we become more site specific in the way we manage the property. So let me start out with a couple of the ways we attack the Bermuda grass. Thing. We plant a lot of grass at Greenwood and you know, we don't really have a good way of evaluating how one grass might do better than another grass. So we had this opportunity in the Wisteria area to replant with the Brightview crew uh, replant an area uh, where the stones were getting leveled, uh, and you can see where that's all happening here. The goal is to identify some different grasses, uh, try some different mixes, go back to some old ways of thinking, try some progressive ideas, and see if that helped us, number one, look good, number two, keep out the Bermuda grass. We, we did a variety of mixtures and blends here uh, with different um, uh, species and varieties there. Some motivated by some of the old fashioned pasture and bent grass mixes that were probably used back in the late 1800s when the cemetery was originally planted. Uh, some local native species mixes that we got from some Long Island folks. And then uh, some more traditional turf grass mixes uh, that might perform better uh, under low mold. So uh, we established them, we looked at their establishment over time. And of course, if you're gonna be data driven, I gotta show you some data. And so we looked at the percent cover, how rapidly the plots established that they were planning. And we saw, you know, relatively rapidly, most of the mixes, except for a few, uh, really established very quickly, which is one way that these mixes could uh, keep out the warm season grasses. If they establish rapidly, maybe they'll be effective in keeping out the Bermuda grass. And yet what we found was almost immediately, even with chemical use prior to the planting, even with new soil brought from off site that did not have Bermuda grass in it, even with those facts, there still remained Bermuda grass in these brand new plots. And again, looking at that data, right? Here are the different mixes that we used, the amount of Bermuda grass there, very low population uh, here at the zero end and very high population there at the top. And we said, well, if you get a rating of about five, that's about as much Bermuda grass as we can tolerate. Once it gets above that dark line, it's really a problem. And what you can see is no surprise from the, in the course of the one season, we've seen significant invasion of Bermuda grass into some of these other areas. Now, some of the current areas that are still going are keeping the Bermuda grass at bay. Here's a, a look at the pasture mix that had a little bit of red clover in there to fix some nitrogen in the atmosphere. 
And here's what the clover, here's what the pasture mix looked like on, when was I there though, Joe? Was I there Monday? Yes, Monday. So this is a picture from Monday. Uh, you can see the trees and beautiful flower there and a pretty good looking pasture mix. But I can tell you, this mix is gonna grow more. It looks really good in the spring. It suffered a little bit in the summer. And again, we've took, uh, taken a whole bunch of data on the way these things look. Here's the way it looked uh, in June of last year uh, after it was established. And here's what it looked like on Monday. And it really has kept the Bermuda grass out. You can see a few uh, weeds invading there. Uh, and, and I can tell you, we've learned a lot about how objectionable weeds are to people and how some herbicide use might be required uh, in some areas where the clientele simply demand uh, not having weeds there. And so when we look at the overall assessment of some of these things, again, that acceptable level is what, in this case, we want to be above. In this case, we want to be above. And in this case, you can see we only have a few mixes that have really persisted well uh, and, and gotten pretty good data performance in, in the time we've been doing. All right, so um, one way of managing the invasive Bermuda grass has been to look at modifying resurfacing and soil handling. And the other way has been to go in there and try to plant grasses that keep it out. The other thing we've been charged with doing is altering mowing, right? Um, and this became probably the biggest technological lift I've ever had to work on uh, that didn't involve some bench science where I was doing something in a lab. We outfitted a whole bunch of mowers with uh, GPS devices that you can see the trace on in the background there. So I wanna talk to you a little bit about the use of technology, but it began with understanding how the plants actually grew uh, that we were mowing. Now the low hanging fruit, so to speak, was um, the raising of the mowing height. Soon as we were charged with doing this, we worked with our outsourced contractor, Brightview, and our perpetual care in-house uh, team. And we said, listen, let's raise everybody's height of cut to three inches. And let's even go to four inches in some places where we can. And the reason we do that is by raising the height of cut, it allows you to extend the mowing interval because the grass grows quite a bit slower when it's mowed higher. The lower you mow grass, the more it grows. The higher you mow grass, the slower it grows. And so we started measuring, you know, I'm in a line of work where you get paid to watch the grass. grow. So I had a technician, Lowell Chamberlain, uh, who did just some excellent work down there with us for a, a couple of years, uh, came to us from the Peace Corps, and I think now might be heading off to the service, into the Air Force. Uh, but for a, a couple of years, he was measuring how grass grew. And this is the point Joe was raising early. We looked at how the cool season grasses did, right? The grasses that would normally grow around here that we want to have. And how did the Bermuda grass grow, the warm season grass that slowly invaded? So this is centimeters of growth per week. And this black line is the line that we can't exceed in growth and maintain the mowing schedule that we're on. That means that the grass is growing at such an excessive rate that our mowing regime cannot keep up with it. So when you look at these areas underneath these curves, first off, you notice the cool season grass slow to start growing. Now it's growing about an inch a week by Mother's Day, right? By the beginning of June, it's growing close to you know, about an inch and a half a week, right? Now you start to see the warm season grass. Bermuda grass actually starts to grow more rapidly earlier in the season than the cool season grasses. And then you can see slowly grows more than an inch a week uh, until mid-July. And then once the heat hits in this particular year, in mid-July, you can see Bermuda grass was literally growing two inches per week. So when Joe was saying it grows over the top of everything, the implications of that is if you wanna stop mowing, you've got a plant that grows pretty aggressive. If you would like to mow less, you would not want to have this grass in there because it's simply growing so rapidly in Brooklyn 
it's literally some, I can tell you honestly, grass, the Bermuda grass grows better in Brooklyn than it does in Southern California or even in the mountains of Arizona, like Scottsdale, Arizona, where I get a little bit of cool weather. We grow, we have a longer Bermuda grass growing season in Brooklyn than we have in Southern points of the United States, which means when you go to mow grass, you got to sort of match up how it grows with how rapidly you mow it. So we, at the same time we're measuring growth, we were measuring mowing productivity. So we put GPS trackers on all the mowers. We did a weekly analysis of the program that we were adapting for this called Fairway IQ. As you might imagine by the name, it, it, we're adapting it from the golf business. The, nothing exists that actually does this. So we stuck all these sensors on the Brightview mowers and we compiled the information and then processed the data to be able to do one, you know, many, many things with that data, as I'll show you in a minute. But one of the things was, well, you got 400 acres and you, it basically, you can see your productivity. If you're going to cut the cemetery 13 to 15 times a year, you have to mow about 200 acres uh, a week. And that's what this black line is. So our data indicated that it took the mowing company a little bit to get up to speed and then did a pretty good job. In fact, productivity was great until July. And then it starts to drop off a little bit and it picks up again and then it drops off and stays below 200 acres. Now, the interesting thing about this is if you notice, look at what the cool season grass growth looks like at this time of year. It really starts to drop off dramatically after that August time period, where the warm season grass is still growing very aggressively. So, you know, if I was in the mowing business and was mowing in Brooklyn, I would think, well, my cool season grasses aren't growing very much. But what this could indicate is our mowing demands could be even greater as the Bermuda grass continues to invade the center. Now, the other thing we were able to do, well, actually, you know what, Joe? Let me shut up here for a minute. And let me see if there's any questions, Sarah, Joe, any questions on anything I've said to this point, because we're going to take a, a little bit of a hard left here in a second and get into some more productivity and operational research. But I, I've dumped a lot on you about the way Bermuda grass grows, the implications of its invasion, and how we've begun to surveil the mowing program, in addition to all the different grasses and systems that we put out there and begun to evaluate. So Joe, Sarah, what do you think? Questions or you guys got any comments or want to color in a little bit or what? Anyone so have I, a, go ahead, sir. Oh no, I was just gonna say, Frank, I think you've been so succinct because no one has plugged in any questions. Everyone is just absorbing the information according to Emily. Um, but I did just want you to just like go over and emphasize how the data is sort of the implications of the data that you have collected are based on a standing threshold as our aesthetic expectations hold currently, right? Thank like that you. is, <laughs> that is the variable that's being, that, that's like the baseline variable that's being, the lens that's being looked at. So. The it's it's a, as you as I've learned, boy, I got speechless, Sarah. It's such a good question. You shut me up. That's that's <laughs> I can tell. There's so many layers to this, as you two know, and maybe many on the call who have any intimacy with Greenwood know. There's this. There's a couple of things I would I learned in this process that I think are worthy of share. Number one is there are very different perceptions of this landscape. If you have someone buried there or you're a lot owner versus whether you're a, a citizen just visiting with no uh, formal association, let's say, uh, with the cemetery. There definitely is a dichotomy of the way the landscape is, is viewed and the lens with which it is viewed. Now, if, if we can both all agree on that and focus on who pays the bills and who writes the emails and who sends the complaints because of the size and scale of this operation and because of the downsizing that's occurred in operations like this, like has happened everywhere else, 
it becomes in many ways a complaint driven operation. And so then we wind up being beholden to the squeaky wheels. And that then Sarah answers your question about the pressures that this urban grassland is under as are many homeowner association lawns as are well a lot of neighborhoods in Sparsdale lawns right yes. that have yeah. to look like the neighbors so so again the, this being a proxy for the American lawn Sarah it's a perfect yes. question for everybody to consider that this is done through the lens of the modern industrialized mechanically managed lawn that's great. Um, Susan A. did just ask, how did you remove the Bermuda grass? When we, the answer uh, is, when, we, oh. when, we, um, when we planted wisteria, the new species and variety area, we treated two thirds of that area with glyphosate and one third of that area with final sand, the OMRI uh, listed um, non-selective product. So, um, I, and so, and then uh, waited seven days, removed that material that goes uh, into the soil pro pile for processing. And then new topsoil was uh, applied and compacted. Does that answer your question? Did that answer the question, Sarah? Yeah, I think it answered it. Excellent. Yeah. In fact, we put um, just, you know, for uh, exploratory purposes, you know, and I'm a scientist who is interested in what people are doing. We partnered with the Scotts company and put in their uh, genetically modified Kentucky bluegrass here at Greenwood um, that they are planting that can be planted on a commercial basis now. Scott's has Kentucky bluegrass, uh, three varieties that are Roundup resistant, as well as use less water and uh, can take less mowing, require less mowing. And then they've developed a warm season grass, uh, St. Augustine grass, that, uh, you know, the alarming thing about that, I'll tell you honestly, is that the sod producers in the South have adopted that technology rapidly. Uh, they're planting, I would say, close to 70% of the sod market in the South is going to be planted to glyphosate tolerant St. Augustine grass. So lest you think that that issue is just related to agriculture, I promise you, it is uh, cheap and effective. And, and it's going to be in the absence of an outcry, it's going to get tested and used. So I can tell you, uh, we didn't give it any, any special treatment. We got sod donated, we got seed, we laid it down. And it, it got treated like everything else. And I can tell you it promptly died. <laughs> it yeah. It did not have the fitness to persist in an environment uh, like Greenwood where it wasn't going to get tender love and care. Yeah. I know in New York state, um, the city just passed the banding, like they they banned the use of glyphosate um, in playgrounds. Yeah. Um, and just based on some activists, there's some pushback to actually for New York State to ban it altogether. Um, you know, a, a monoculture of just gen genetically modified grasses, just in my mind, might create some feral effects that get out of our control, like we always see. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to go down the glyphosate wormhole. All right, uh, Joe, go there and never come back. Uh, but I can tell you, I know it's so deep. <laughs> well, I can tell you, honestly, um, I, I think it's responsible right now to ally public concern in many ways that in public facing or public interaction places that, you know, we limit its use. I, I think that's smart. Um, I think a lot of people are doing it, but I can tell you the people holding on to glyphosate the most are the native plant people, people trying to maintain native landscapes that are under siege from real invasive plants, nasty things, hogweed, wild garlic, Japanese stillgrass, you name it. Uh, they, they really, uh, it's, 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 I can only say that these natural areas are simply under siege. Now, let me, unless there's other questions, Sarah, let me get back to Yakin. What do you think? Go back to Yak Yakin. away. Yeah. All right. 
All right. So, 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 so the next uh, chapter in the story is still about mowing, but this is again, you know, one of the things I felt really I wanted to do with Joe was very interesting to me as well is, you know, he's got to manage with Art and Sarah this relationship with an outsourced partner, and we have a bright view crew that remains that continues to manage the perpetual care lot. So we have two crews doing mowing. Sorry, just to clarify um, that we have a Greenwood crew. So, yeah, you said Brightview crew. So we have I mean, a I mean Greenwood crew. Sorry, right. Greenwood crew that manages the perpetual care lots. Thank you for clarifying that, Joe. So you've got uh, you know two different crews out there mowing. So we have the tracking data that we put in manually into this spreadsheet and began to look at the intervals between how often bright you mow. So we figured out bright you mows the whole cemetery every 13 days on average. And then through some uh, handwritten data collection, we found out that the PC lot crew visits uh, each island about every 16 days. And there are these uh, relationships that we have with our perpetual care uh, people and Sarah and Joe, please help me out here that I believe and I don't even know if I'm using the right terminology, Joe and Sarah, so please correct me if I'm wrong. But we have this relationship with people who have this perpetual care, whether it, depending on the amount of endowment, the size of the endowment, the least everybody gets, as best I know it, Joe, is their plot mode every seven days. That's good enough for this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. The goal is to make sure the perpetual care lots are mowed every seven days. Brightview mows every 13 days. The, uh, the Brightview, I'm sorry, the Greenwood crew mows every 16 days. And so we analyzed the, the, the data from Brightview and the data from Greenwood, and we put it together and we said, well, the average interval between these two uh, mowing operations was between six and seven days, lo and behold. And in fact, when you narrow it down further and say, okay, um, was, how often were they within five to nine days of actually mowing, you know, you know, either every five days or every nine days? So 82% of the time, um, you know, we're getting these lots, uh, 80 to 84% of the time, we're getting these lots mowed within a five to nine day period. And about 20% of the time or 18% of the time, uh, we're getting the mode outside the five to nine days. So we looked at the data even further and we said, okay, well, how often when we're outside the five to nine day period, are we longer than that? And it's only about 10% of the time. So 90% of the time, our mowing operation is in fact uh, meeting the needs of our perpetual care uh, folks. Now, I, I just go drill into this a little bit. Um, the data says, you know, that you're, when you use data like this, you can have an assurance that your operation is at least meeting its goals. Now, what is very interesting to us, and I think Sarah and Joe would, would agree, we want to ground through this with time and location, because we're somewhat of a complaint-driven operation at the grassland level, um, you know, it's going to be essential for determining you know, how we mow because going back to the way grass grows, right? We know that the darn grass grows so fast, mowing it every week might not even be enough, right? So this gets to Sarah's broader questions about, you know, huh, what are we married to with having a grassland like this in 2021? And it looks like the current mowing productivity is going to be hampered. Uh, by the growth of these grasses, because especially with the warm season grasses growing uh, more and more. Okay, so let's get to the end here where we're talking about maybe completely transforming the way we mow and creating these perpetual meadows that enhance ecosystem services in a way that we can measure. And Sarah's just done such a wonderful job of working on it. Here's one of those pictures of the 40 acres that's currently being used uh, and, and, and developed through the growing season out at Greenwood now. And so just to give you a timeline, lest you think this was an easy process, lest you think like, wow, 40 acres, that's maybe not very much, or 40 acres, wow, that's a lot. 
uh, whether you're a half empty or a half full person, I choose to be a half full person for the nature of this project. The timeline of how this has come about is that it started in June of 2019. We identified about 100 acres that we were going to stop mowing until November. And then another 100 acres, roughly, that we were going to start going from mowing every two weeks to grow, mowing them monthly. We're going to mow them now at five inches, much higher height of cut, and mow them less frequently. <laughs> well, let's just say that by August 2019, we had completely resumed regular mowing on about 100 acres uh, of the ground. So we uh, had to resume mowing. It was, there's a variety of things that we learned here uh, that I'm sure we'll talk about as we get going, but let's just suffice it to say, we, uh, for a complaint driven organization, I can say we got our fair share of complaints. Now, Joe and Sarah might say, well, I don't know if we got any more complaints. I don't know if they were any different complaints, but they were enough for us to have to change the way we, our plan was to create meadows and change the mold. So then one of the things that became very clear was that, you know, maybe it's okay you don't mow, but oh my goodness gracious, weeds are, weeds are everywhere. Weeds are everywhere, right? So there was a compromise that was struck eventually that got us down to approximately 40 acres. I think it's 43 some odd acres that we've now been able to keep in perpetual metal. And we implemented some pre-emergent and post-emergent weed control in October, 2009, and in the spring of 2020 and in the fall of 2020 and now again in the spring of uh, 21. We now have begun to cease, we ceased mowing in June of 2020 on those 40 acres and began to manage um, that uh, meadow through the year. And I wanna talk a little bit about where we are with that now because it's a perfect transition to Sarah being able to uh, talk about the benefits of these areas. First off, we developed a specification uh, that now becomes part of the operation because of some of the data we've developed. Now we've currently adapted, the, adapted this a little bit further, but that was the original move was to create specs that we can work with our outsource contractor to develop these 40 acres. We also monitored using data how well they did the timing of these meadows and what kind of equipment they use. They had to use specialized equipment to mow the meadow at five inches, and they had to do it at the right time. And you can see we're able to monitor their adherence to the specifications. We then went out over the, during the pandemic and, and, and took data on the meadows now that we had the weed control done, we left some untreated areas, we had a real good sense of how this was gonna perform, and so first we looked at weed, weed pressure, you know, relatively weed free on the left here versus uh, uh, an enormous amount of nut sedge and annual grasses that begin to grow. So obviously the characteristics from an aesthetic perspective for weeds was a big issue. The next was stone visibility, right? Is how, you know, rating of four, uh, very, you know, very obscured, a rating of six means uh, relatively visible. Right, you can still see them uh, even though the grasses are not being mowed. Right now, we looked at lodging. Right, how much are they bent over? Right, seven is lots of lodging, four is only some lodging that they bent over. Right, so then we looked at overall general appearance. How do they look? Some weeds, some obscured stones, less weeds, stones are more visible. And this really is where our work now transitions very nicely, Sarah, to some of the things that you were able to measure out there about what introducing some of these 40 acres uh, might have done. So um, I don't know if you want to take questions or if you want to just transition right into you to start talking. How do you want to handle it? Um, Joe, are there any questions currently? If not, we only have about 12 minutes left until seven. And I would like for, to leave room at the end, just for everyone to chat. So go after it, Sarah. Get after right. it, girl. Gonna right. do Share it. Share your screen. I'm going to stop sharing. You got the screen? I got it. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
All right. So what was happening in tandem with the launch of the urban grasslands research was a pretty extensive two-year wildlife survey. It was conducted by a biologist from Applied Ecological Services, which is a firm down in Philadelphia, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe. Um, and one of the sub-surveys was looking at our wild bees. The wild bee survey was conducted by um, Sarah Kornbluth and Parker Gambino. They are research scientists um, stationed at the American Museum of Natural History, and they study and survey the bees in New York. Um, why I mentioned wild bees is that wild bees are, the presence of them, the diversity of them, they are an indicator of ecological health. Um, and I will go, and, and also they're incredibly important to the ecosystem services that uh, Frank alluded to earlier. So some of the provisioning, they're really important for agriculture. Um, they are here responsible for pollinating 80% of flowering plants. They are foundational to the local food web, um, which if you are, you know, keeping an ear in, sorry, something keeps popping up on my phone, uh, keeping an ear to just the research on insects, uh, the biomass of insects have actually declined by approximately 75% globally. Um, and our wild bees are highly endangered. Um, honeybees are not wild. I just want to plug that in because most people do think that honeybees are one native to here and that, that they're domestic. We, we should only view honeybees as a domesticated animal. Um, we farm them. Um, there are 4,000 native bee species in North America, and through this survey, um, we found 62 native species at Greenwood. Uh, so I wish I overlaid Frank's map of the meadow areas, um, but I promise you the meadow areas align with the blue dots, most of the blue dots on this map. So the number of genera, and by genre, by genre, I mean it's the taxonomic rank that falls above the species level and below the family level. Um, 18 different genera were surveyed at Greenwood. And as you can see, the highest number of genera appeared around areas that were either managed as meadow were gardens or areas that just had less frequent mowing, so just less disturbance, um, because the areas areas that did have less frequent mowing, you know, a lot of the floral were able to come to flower occasionally. You had the ephemeral appearance of those floral resources. Um, and I'm going to bring up so. If no one, there are some people who are not in New York or in Brooklyn right now. So Greenwood coming to this space, it is not quite homogenous. There are valleys, there are hills. Some areas are more, you know, densely shaded with large trees, other, you know, and then other areas open up to wide vistas. Um, this is an example of part of a landscape where aesthetically, we, it looks, you know, full and vibrant of life and flowers, but in fact, you know, the plants that we see right now that are currently in bloom, they're not in bloom for that long. Um, and this area, as you can see, is being managed not as meadow, so it is being mowed more frequently. So there are no floral resource or very few floral resources that are able to appear. So we look at, or bees look at this, and other pollinators look at this as a food desert. Um, this is a different example of, it is a really steep sloped area over by our historic chapel in the background. And this was designed by Larry Wiener Landscape Associates. And this is about a 1.9 acre area that had that has been planted with 72 native uh, perennials and shrubs and this is one of the areas I'm just going to go back and I will use my cursor this is the areas with one of the highest amount of genre surveyed of wild bees 
Um, and then you've seen this before. This is the area that's managed as meadow. And although it doesn't look like much, there still is more significant diversity of bees surveyed there than say the pollinator food desert, which is actually right over here around area four. Um, I wanted to include this because if it wasn't for the experiment that we launched where we effectively took 100 acres out of mowing rotation, we would have not been able to find Claytonia virginiana springing up. Uh, this is commonly known as spring beauty. It's a ephemeral, uh, ephemeral native wildflower and it's endemic to New York City and New York State, but previously we had never noticed it. We had never noticed it. And that is, again, because the landscape is being mowed, we were never able to, it was never able to come to flower. Oh good, Lisa says she saw this over the weekend. <laughs> um, so one of the efforts that we began uh, was when we saw patches of Claytonia popping up, we roped it off so that mowers would not mow the flowers. And we left this until the end of their flowering season um, so that they could be pollinated and come to seed and the seed could be returned to the seed bake and we could expand pollinator or expand, yeah, pollinator habitat. Um, I hate to do this plug with honeybees again, but conserving pollinators is not protecting the honeybees. Pollinator conservation is actually habitat conservation. Um, and bringing, just bringing it back to uh, the, the waste that is produced when we manage these landscapes. As Joe mentioned, these are the numbers as it pertains to Greenwood. By taking 40 acres, out of normal rotation and converting it to meadow, we effectively reduced our greenhouse gas, gas emissions about 24%. Uh, relatedly to just all of New York City, um, the New York City land cover type, this data was taken from the Natural Areas Conservancy, but then I broke it down into smaller numbers just to really flesh out some of the impact. Um, so to just mow with uh, two, two stroke engines, uh, gasoline power mowers and trimmers would pretty much be the same as adding 963 cars to the streets of uh, New York City. Um, I actually looked this up previously, there's just under 2 million cars. So this would be adding you know, like an additional, it, it would effectively be like 5% of the vehicle, the registered vehicles in, in New York City. Um, I also just wanted to emphasize that cemeteries are comprise a pretty significant land parcel in New York. Uh, so the impact that cemeteries can have just by changing the way that they are managing their lawns is very significant. Um, lastly, because I want us to wrap us up so we can talk, um, whenever we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, it's always related to like the abstraction of the climate, but I did just want to uh, just, just sort of like bring back into our focus and our imagination that the uh, gasoline mowers and trimmers according to the EPA are emitting about 124 times more volatile um, organic compounds into the air. So that includes like carbon monoxide and nitrous oxides. Uh, carbon monoxide is incredibly harmful to human health. Um, it replaces oxygen in the, blood, in the bloodstream. And then uh, nitrogen oxide, when it's emitted, it reacts with heat and sunlight specifically, and it will convert into smog and in particulate matter, which over a prolonged period of time, communities who live in areas where there are these points of emissions can develop asthma and all other health issues. Um, but the ground level ozone, also known as smog, also has deleterious effects on the plant life in the area as well. So there are some species here that are sensitive to ground level ozone. Um, 
And what this does is it risks them to disease and weakening over time because it essentially slows their, it interferes with their ability to photosynthesize. And so they're growing slower, which conversely means that they are not sequestering as much carbon dioxide as we would like or as they are able to. And then this just has ripple effects into the ecosystem. So it degrades, it reduces habitat quality, it changes the water nutrient cycles that we also covered in terms of like what ecosystem services are going. So that's where I wanted to end on. And let's chat. Let me stop the share. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. It's, it's great to see that stuff. Um, and I can tell you, we saw blue stem come up when we stopped mowing. Joe, right. I think there's other trees that you found uh, when we stopped mowing. Um, you know, that's a landscape that, that evolved from no mechanical mowing to essentially being entirely governed by mechanical mowing. The entire landscape is whatever's not a tree is essentially selected for because it tolerates frequent mowing. Frequent mowing used to mean weekly, now it means bi-weekly and a little bit longer. And I think there's a lot more opportunities, but I think Sarah and Joe, you would agree, safety remains a big issue in a place like a cemetery. In the world of push-pull that we live in, some of these uh, areas that we let go for a while um, can occasionally be safety problems. Joe? Because, because they're trip hazards. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Um... They might look beautiful as meadows, but they do obscure the stones to the point where someone might trip. But I will ask a question now from the chat. Sure. How much time do you have for this one? What What is the definition of a of a weed? What was the definition of a weed? Uh, I think Whitman or Emer uh, Waldo Emerson said it's a plant whose virtues we have not realized yet. It's my favorite. It's that is a good um, one. Yeah, weeds are, uh, you know, we generally weeds are something that, of course, like everything else, grew out of our agrarian society where they got in the way of crop production. Essentially, we define them as things that disrupt the function of the site. And if the function of the site is to produce 100 bushels of corn, that plant's in the way, right? Now, when you take it all the way, evolve it to a cemetery in the American lawn, you have a very subjective uh you have a very subjective environment that you that that you're in now except for this annual weeds that are not perennial or perennial plants that don't play nice with the other plants and allow for a diverse planting are plants we've got to that disrupt in my opinion disrupt the function of the site the primary function of the site for a place like brooklyn is to get the water into the soil so it doesn't run off and wash out the city or flow it into the East River with all the pollutants and keep the area cool, right? Hold the water and it's like a, vac of, you know, like a big air conditioner in the middle of a really tough part of Brooklyn. So, you know, I think about it as like, that's its primary function. And if you don't have plants everywhere, like you got crabgrass or you got plants that don't grow well there and then die off for a period of year, leave bare soil, the rains come, now, so now the area isn't serving the function of the site. So I've got a reason why I want that weed out of there. Or if Sarah now wants to have some, a little more diverse planting, but then let's say morning glory came in or Ipomoea came in, a bindweed came in like we saw recently, and it starts choking out some of these things. Well, now that's a weed, right? So we've got to get in and, and do some management there. So I think we're trying to broaden the definition of a weed, but Joe and Sarah, what do our lot owners think a weed is? Any plant that's probably not turf grass specifically, but, but I'll say that I wanna clarify something you said earlier about um, the native plant people using herbicide. You know, the, the not so secret truth is that in order to establish that you know, beautiful meadow by the chapel, we had to kill the existing turf grass there and we had to use herbicide. There's always a balancing act in these situations in which we're, saying is it is it is the outcome worth it um yeah i think i yeah and i couldn't agree more joe and i think our thinking about this has evolved and our goal is 
listen, my goal as a plant scientist who's worked in this industry for 30 years is to get people from being reliant. I don't want them reliant on these things. If they're tools that they occasionally use for definable, measurable, I did it for this, I evaluated it, did that, I'm okay. But if now you're just doing it willy nilly like the weed and feed madness that goes on on the American lawn every spring, you know, the Yankees sell it during a game or the Mets are selling it during a game, you know, you see ads for these things. What we're trying to do is, is get the American public and the cemetery public to want to embrace less reliance. And what we're finding is we may have to zero out the population that's there now systematically over the next couple of years and then institute management that then keeps them out, that is sustainable. And that's the way I think we view vegetation management moving forward. And if there's soft choices to do it, I think we're going to do that. And I don't begrudge anyone who has sees a lawn that's filled with quote unquote weeds and says that's objectionable because it's almost an unconscious aversion that people have to these landscapes. They don't even recognize the fact that when someone sees a overgrown lawn, they think it's a sign of neglect. It's often just immediate. And what what we have to do to change this is to make it seem to 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 make the argument that it's an intentional intervention in the landscape in order to preserve the landscape over time. It's not just, you know, we're not just lazy and not mowing. We're actually putting, trying to say that, you know, mowers out in the landscape, they tend to damage the stones because they're mowing at such a rate that it's just inevitable. It's like, you know, if a uh, pinball machine mowing in a cemetery. So, they're going to bang into the stones. They're going to sort of cause erosion. Um, if we keep the turf a little bit longer, if we lessen the mowing, is there a threshold between when it becomes a symbol of neglect and when it becomes a symbol of intention? And that's sort of the, the line that we're looking at. But before I go continue on my um, tangential um, diatribe there. Let's look at a quote. Uh, let's look at a question here from Misty Rain. Over time, with space in the cemetery lessening and burials tending toward green with the millennial generation, could more and more lawn be turned to unmowed grasslands? Also, could the public opinion dilemma, American lawn versus unmowed or native grassland, be addressed with different, different marketing from GW? It's a great question. Um, yeah, I'll leave the marketing to you and I'll just say this. What we're talking about is managing these meadows differently. I can tell you they take as much thought and intention, uh, more so, I would say, than simply going out and mowing. Man and in fact, getting people to manage these meadow areas the way we want, maybe introducing new species, um, is much more complicated than sending people out to motor landscapes. Some of it is an adaptation we've made because, well, labor force is, is what it is. This requires some expertise to do. And so it tends to be avoided because you got to pay more for expertise for people to come in and have this kind of management. But Joe's point is well taken. It gives this unkempt look when in fact, it's just being differently managed. It's not being managed necessarily any less. It might be less from an energy perspective, but it's more from an ecological perspective. We're working with the landscape as opposed to trying to bend it to our will. I'm just trying to see if I, well said, Frank. I, I'm, I, I'm just trying to see if I have one of these postcards that we created. We created a postcard in the midst of a firestorm of just, uh, Immense complaints against what we were doing in the you summer. Just throw postcards in a fire. <laughs> yeah, it was like that. It was like, hey, but <laughs> we created a, a um, an email address called it was called grasslands at green, uh, greenwood dot com, and we encouraged people to write us with their reactions. <laughs> so we opened ourselves up to really seeing what people thought, and what what we. And I would go out there and talk to a lot of lot owners. And what they would say is the argument that you hear often from people who care about the environment, but have sort of conflicts about how to go about preserving it, whatever that means. But 
they would say, you know, I really like what you guys are doing there, but don't do it on my lot. Do it on that lot. So I think what we're really trying to do is bridge this cognitive dissonance between what is what we need to do um, to sort of lessen our environmental impact here and what the outcome of that is going to be. As far as your question about you know marketing, these postcards which explain the collaboration, why we were doing what we were doing, you know, I don't know if they changed any minds. Um, I think we, sh we approached the first year of this with a great deal of hubris and we thought that no one was gonna notice when we stopped mowing a hundred acres, which in hindsight is just ridiculous. But we thought that we could try these different things and not get away with it, but that people would be understanding. And in the cemetery in which there's there's a specific emotional connection between the the height of turf grass, this opinion of neglect, and grieving families, and so on. It's much more complicated than just saying, you know, we have Prospect Park, we won't mow an acre of it, and people might not care. You know, it's just here, it's different. So we can't really, though, fundamentally shift this whole thing. It needs to happen as a sea change, a bunch of actions coming together where people have sort of recognized that. These urban grasslands are in your backyard. They're where your kids play soccer. If we can change the way those areas are managed, perhaps we can begin to shift this American obsession with lawn. So that's my soapbox. And how often, a question from Kevin Zambrano, how often is GW converting spaces to native landscapes such as the Chapel Hillside? Well, Kevin, we're always looking for opportunities. Um, we expanded the meadow from 1.6 to about two acres last spring. And we're always looking for opportunities where we can make these interventions and have them look appropriate. You know, the thing is, uh, tall grasses don't always, uh, native tall ornamental grasses don't always, aren't always appropriate in terms of the way they look, but converting areas to meadow is easier than that. So uh, yeah, it's 7-Eleven. I sort of trailed off there at the end, Kevin. I'm sorry that I didn't answer your question effectively, but we're always looking for opportunities. So there's that. Is there a planting plan for the Dell water area? It seems like it is being more slightly managed. Is that part of the study? We are in the midst of a master planning process for Dell Water. And we're, it's going to be a really, I think, an incredible transition for that space, one that I really love in the cemetery. And I think you'll, um, if you like Dell Water, you're really going to like what we do. It's going to be a few years from now, but um, yeah, stay tuned. All right. Are there any more questions? I do have some plugs of upcoming events. Um, so as like almost a fortuitous series that was planned by the gods, um, I'm just kidding. Uh, it was, you know, scheduled and planned by Joe and I, <laughs> in May, we're having a webinar and a walk led by Ellie Irons and Anne Prococo from the next Epoch Seed Library. They are community activists and um, environmental artists. Uh, they originally were based in Brooklyn, but since the pandemic, they've moved elsewhere. But their talk will actually be on the Anthropocene and the weeds that are in urban spaces and the plant life that is colonized that are colonizing these areas. Um, then in June, we have a webinar and a pollinator walk with Sarah Kornbluth, who I mentioned earlier from the American Museum of Natural History. Um, she will be talking about her uh, bee survey. And then in July, we have a webinar being led by Richard Shaw, who Frank mentioned earlier, who conducted the soil survey here. And so he will actually be doing a little bit of soil science 101 in that webinar. I've been requested um, a message to stop mowing lots and plant 
planting lots of weeds. So we might take you up on that. We actually uh, don't need to plant weeds, right? Like exactly they, there's right. a there there's a ferality to plants that is either it can be seen as really advantageous, you know, moving moving the world forward and regenerating areas and also the feral effects that we don't like, like invasiveness and stuff. So I want to just say that you 22 folks are terrific. You stayed till 7.15 on a Thursday night to talk about grass with us. So we got to just give you guys a round of applause. Thank you all for coming out. Um, and you hope to come to the other talks that we give and um, we yeah, hope you had a good really time good. tonight. They're going to be All really right. good. Yeah. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.